I, like I think most all of us in the Christian community, you know, I have people that I love that are far from God. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be able to walk into a church that is preaching truth. Uh, Jesus said the truth will set you free. And, and he said something really interesting in that. Uh, I am the truth. He didn't say I am a truth. He said I am the truth. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I am the embodiment of it. So it's not just his, his he didn't even just say I, I, I say truth. It's everything about him is truth. And so, uh, you know, I want to bring that out in my preaching and being able to accurately handle the Word of God so that I can be a workman who need not be ashamed mm -hmm. is a very important thing because the truth resonates with people. Welcome to Conversations with Tyndale House Scholars in America. Interviews that highlight the kingdom impact that scholars from Tyndale House bring to the United States. In this episode, we hear from Jason Fritz, lead pastor at Illuminate Community Church in Scottsdale, Arizona. Jason has crossed the pond more than once to utilize the renowned resource library for in-depth sermon research. Join us as Jason discusses the library's value and his fervor for conveying the truth of scripture. Don't forget, you can find more information about us as well as listen to all previous content by visiting our website at friendsoftendalehouse.com. Great, Jason, thank you for joining me. Uh, you uh, got your education at Arizona State University and then a demon at Phoenix Seminary. Correct. Um, anything else I should know in there about your education? Uh, well, it was a circuitous route. I actually set out to get the most secular degree that I could, believe it or not, on the front end, because I was being mentored by a pastor at the time. And I was talking to him about it. I said, well, what are your thoughts? Knowing that I was going to go into pastoral ministry, going on to seminary. He said, if I was you, I, I would get some street credibility mm -hmm. with an understanding of uh, how the world thinks, the questions they're, they're asking, how they're being answered, and, and understand the, the prevailing epistemology behind the times. And knowing that you're going to go to seminary, learning how to apply biblical truth to answer the questions that the hurting world is asking. And so that's what I did. And, uh, and he was right. That was very, very helpful. And then I carried that uh, with me onto my doctoral studies where uh, my dissertation was specifically in the, in the area of homiletics in the age of epistemological egalitarianism. Wow. Which is a big fancy way of saying, mm -hmm. how do you connect as a preacher with a postmodern relativistic mindset? That's great. Yeah. And then uh, you've been to Tinder House yes. in Twice. Yep. a couple of times. Uh -huh. So what took you over and how did you find it? Well, I heard about it through Wayne Grudem. Uh -huh. Yeah, he told me about it. And of course, he was doing massive work there on, on the ESV. And at that time, he told me it was one of the finest theological libraries around. And so uh, I was beginning to study prep for uh, Hebrews, mm -hmm. and that's a little bit in, in the deeper end of, of, of the, the pool, and uh, you recommended that I, that I go there and use the library as a resource, and I did, and it was uh, phenomenal. It was great. I'm very glad you suggested it. So uh, what was it like for you when you were there? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 was, uh, it, was, it was a unique experience. It was, it was what I expected, and it wasn't what I expected. First of all, I felt like the, uh, that Tyndale House did a lot of the heavy lifting, so to speak, because the uh, sifting through of the resources had been done. So the things that I was looking for, you mm -hmm. know, let's just say were very high quality. You know, yeah. uh, pretty much every re resource on the, on the shelf that was there. Um, but there are some unique things to Tyndale House that mm -hmm. I think people don't realize. Uh, one of the more special parts of it for me is the collection of people who were there while I was studying some of the same things. And I think mm -hmm. they do that by design, mm -hmm. if I remember right. So for example, um, there was a gentleman there who was writing commentary on Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And so again, one of the more special things about my time there was hearing the little, I don't know if you call it a symbol or a gong, Gong. The, the gong would go off twice a day, and then the students would pour out of the library onto the, that grassy area. And uh, by the way, this is where I learned to drink milk with my tea uh, out there, <laughs> which was great. I still do to this day. Um, but then interacting with them. Yeah. And so this individual and myself, we had some great conversations about what I was studying, what he was studying, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, got to talk about uh, fun things like who, who is the author of Hebrews. And did you solve that? Yeah. No, no, we didn't. But but uh, I I was sharpening the pencil with his help. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And um, 
anything then that impacted you after coming back was would you say that's um, impacted you after? Yeah, well, well certainly. I mean, it, it made me want to go again, and I, and I went back for the second time uh, a couple of summers ago because I was uh, beginning to study for Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so because the resources were so valuable to me the first time, uh, the second time I went back, and my approach was a little bit different, and again, this is where the resources came into play, because I wanted to approach the book of Genesis in a different way. Typically, you know, you'll, you'll hear a preacher talk about uh, age of the earth, let's talk about dinosaurs, evolution. But again, part of my background was wanting to find ways to connect what many people see as this ancient, antiquated, outdated text to modern times. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, the first few chapters of Genesis lay some pretty powerful uh, framework that speak loudly to the culture mm -hmm. we live in today. For example, when God creates, he creates in binaries. Yeah. Light, dark, heaven, earth, land, sea, male and female. You know, incredibly relevant mm -hmm. topics for our time. Yeah. Well, the Bible's been speaking to this from the very beginning. So again, having the kinds of resources that help me explore what I want to bring out of the text uh, was a tremendous advantage. And that's, that's why I went back. I plan, I plan to go back again if, I, Great, you're welcome. if I'm invited. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, yeah. Now, you're someone who's passionate about um, the scriptures. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us about how that informs your ministry and your preaching? <clears throat> well, I think um, two, two answers to that question. Number one, I like... I think most all of us in the Christian community, you know, I have people that I love that are far from God. Mm -hmm. And I want them to be able to walk into a church that is preaching truth. Uh, Jesus said the truth will set you free. And, and he said something really interesting in that. Uh, I am the truth. He didn't say I am a truth. He said I am the truth. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I am the embodiment of it. So it's not just his, his he didn't even just say I, I, I say truth. It's everything about him is truth. And so, uh, you know, I want to bring that out in my preaching and being able to accurately handle the Word of God so that I can be a workman who need not be ashamed mm -hmm. is a very important thing because the truth resonates with people. So do you see what I'm getting at? In other words, the, the people, it's, there's a hurting world and, and the truth will set them free. That's why I'm passionate. I'm passionate about it. I, I had a friend who had walked away from the faith, crisis of faith, kind of the, the typical deconstructionist, and uh, it wasn't working for him. I had encouraged him to get into church. He lives in a different city. And, uh, and so he attended an evangelical church, and uh, the preacher was, was giving a sermon series on the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Right? Essentially, it's another personality mm -hmm. metric. And uh, it meant nothing to him. You know? So I want people to walk in to illuminate and be hit with the truth of Jesus. Jesus is full of grace and truth. It is important how you deliver the truth. People won't accept it unless it's delivered with grace. So that's why I'm passionate about it because mm -hmm. I've seen it transform. You were with us, you know, last Sunday and, and part of that truth is revealed in changed lives, transformed lives. So every Sunday we're looking at different ways that we can put the power of God on display mm -hmm. uh, for our people. So, yeah. Can you tell us about your spiritual disciplines personally? Yeah, um, so three things uh, I've learned shape me personally. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. Mm -hmm. And so I try to absorb myself in those, those three things daily. I've always, uh, uh, for many years, uh, I, I, I had the blessing of being discipled when I first came to Christ. And that was very transformative because the um, spiritual discipline of spending time in the Word, uh, I've, I've had for a while. But I'll tell you what, what, what really impacted me over the last few years. Mark chapter 1. Mm -hmm. I stumbled across the verse that talked about Jesus waking up early in the morning and what, while it was still dark. Yeah. And what does he do? He goes and he prays. And Luke talks about how Jesus would often go to lonely places and pray. And then what's interesting is what you see as a follow-up. Jesus will spend time with the Lord and then he'll come down and he'll, he'll tell his man, he'll say, okay guys, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is where we're going. And so that is a spiritual discipline that I've added over the last uh, probably four or five years. Uh, just that intensive time. I mean, and I like to be out in nature. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, uh, I'll get on my dirt bike and ride out in the desert with a little chair, my Bible, and watch the sunrise and um, 
be exposed to God's creation and find those lonely places. Right? Yeah. Well, it's a great thing to do around here as well. Oh, yeah, and we live in the perfect environment for that. Yeah, good. And then <clears throat> with people who are looking to go further, um, how would you advise people to get into the scriptures? Well, first of all, I would advise them to sit under solid biblical preaching. Uh, I'm thankful that I was raised in a church with a pastor who knew how to rightly divide the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And that began to stir in me. It also helped me discern truth from falsehood mm -hmm. as well, just sitting under good preaching, uh, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I, I have encouraged people today to uh, use technology mm -hmm. as a form of um, meditation, Bible meditation, you know. Uh, I'm still kind of a paper guy. Yeah. But there are some tremendous resources out there that can be used through uh, technology. And, and, of course, the exhortation is, how does God reveal himself? Well, he reveals himself through his word. Mm -hmm. So uh, how else are you going to understand God's will for your life and get to know the God who created you if you don't have your fingers in his hands? I, I've, I've told our people before, I think one of the sweetest sounds to God's ears is just the, the sound of his people moving their hands through mm -hmm. the pages of, mm -hmm. of his book. So, yeah. And just a, a final question. When you're conceiving of a sermon as a mm -hmm. Bible teacher, how do you go about yeah. that, that process of yeah. finding what you should be delivering to that's, the that, that, That's a great question. The way I do it is, I, one of our core values is to be engaged in culture. And uh, examples of this would be Daniel and his friends in Babylon. You know, I just think that's the, that's the it's, it's just such a cool, I'm so glad it's there because Christians are not to be separated from the culture, but we're, we are to enter into it and influence it for Christ. And it's Paul at the Oropagus of Mars Hill, you know, and he begins with a compliment. You, you're all very religious men. Well, yes, we are religious men. You want to have all your bases covered, so there's this, this statue that you have to an unknown God. Well, yes, we want to have all our We don't want to fit, unnecessarily offend some God that we don't know about, withhold the rain from us or whatever. Let me tell you about that God that you don't know. It's contextual genius, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and he's the creator of heaven and earth, right there. You know, I mean that's 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 the language of Genesis, even. You know, and the God that you don't know, and uh, I I so I'm constantly thinking about what's happening in the culture, and again I think it does go back to a lot of my my educational training, understanding the questions that the culture is wrestling with understanding the answers they're providing, which are not working, by the way, because mm -hmm. people are more twisted up than ever, and then bringing the truth of God's word to bear on it. Um, I love being that. So a as an example of this, um, then after we finish Romans, we're going into Daniel for this uh -huh. very purpose. Right. Now, John Lennox, I have to give credit where credit is due, and I know you, you, you know John. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that introduction, by the way, if we can swing it. But he, uh, he has a book on Daniel. It's not necessarily commentary, per uh -huh. se, but it's called Against the Flow. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's a that is so timely. His book was written mm -hmm. a few years ago. But it's all about how do you step into the culture and, and transform it for the sake of the gospel. So that's where we're headed next. And that's, that's the right. thinking behind it because, yeah. you know, Paul, we are ambassadors. What is an ambassador? A goodwill representative of some other place. And we want to take as many people to heaven with us as possible. That's great. Well, yeah. That sounds really exciting. Yeah. So thank you very much for sharing no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, your wisdom with us. Yeah, thanks for being with us too. Appreciate it, Peter. My name's Peter Williams, Principal of Tyndale House in Cambridge. Thank you very much for watching this video of conversations with Tyndale House scholars in America. And thank you also for sharing this because sharing a video like this helps spread the impact. Tyndale House exists to raise up Bible scholars who are servant-hearted and who are looking to help the church globally. So if you can like this uh, or share it with others that would be very helpful thank you also for your support of tinderhouse and do visit the website friendsoftinderhouse.com